my name is Joshua New. I'm a policy analyst with the Center for Data Innovation. We are here with Greg Corrado, who is a senior research scientist on Google's machine learning team. Uh, we're going to be asking Greg some questions about his experience at Google developing machine learning technology. So welcome. Thanks for doing this. Happy to be here. Sure. Uh, so you helped develop RankBrain, which is an artificial intelligence system that Google used to help prioritize search results. Mm -hmm. But rather than literally interpreting a, a query, like just searching mm -hmm. for the exact text, mm -hmm. it tries to learn about what a user is really searching for, what the question mm -hmm. they really want to mm -hmm. answer. Mm -hmm. um, so how does that work, and why is that preferable to a literal interpretation? Well, so it's it's not that it's preferable, it's that it's complementary. So um, uh, language is, is imprecise, and it's subtle, and there are almost an innumerable way of saying the same thing, or about the same thing, or adding a layer of um, additional context. And so part of what we're, we're seeing is that a, a large fraction of the queries that we get every day, we've never seen before. They're actually brand new. And so part of what this system does is it allows us to interpret these things that are never before seen questions and give a reasonable guess about what the user is asking about. Cool. Um, so before that, uh, you worked on a, a system that, that made uh, a, a bunch of news a couple years ago. Mm -hmm. It was an artificial intelligence system that you trained it on on millions of hours of YouTube videos. Mm -hmm. And at the mm -hmm. end of it, mm -hmm. without human input, it could if you asked it what a cat was, it could give you an approximation of what a cat was. It had learned that. Um, so comparing those kind of two technologies, those are very different functions. Yeah. But are there kind of overlaps in approach and techniques in terms of how you train a computer system to learn what people are, are typing versus what they're searching in a YouTube video? Um, yeah. are, there, are there big differences, or can you learn from one process and apply it to another? So they're very different. Um, they are both machine learning, and they both use this same kind of machine learning technology that's called deep neural networks. Mm -hmm. um, but other than that, the commonalities really, the real, there really aren't very many commonalities but beyond that. So, for example, the, the cat discovery system was actually really uh, a science experiment in unsupervised learning to see if without, as you say, any human guidance or labels, the system could discover basic concepts, the kinds of things that show up in YouTube videos. And the answer to that scientific question was yes, um, but it doesn't naturally turn into any actual practical application. Sure. Whereas for a system like Rank brain, we have a very specific practical ob objective that we can we can tackle directly. Cool. Um, so uh, just about a year ago now, Google uh, open sourced its TensorFlow platform, which is this this framework that Google built a, a, a huge amount of machine learning applications that it, that it still uses today, um, and made made the source code freely available to the public. Um, why do that? You, you Google invests so much money in making this technology. How does Google benefit by giving it away for free? Right, so the first version of uh, a deep learning system that we built at Google was entirely internal, and there was just no way of open sourcing it. But when we, we made the decision to sort of start over fresh with a new version, the decision was made very early on to try to build something that was open sourceable, because we think that it's, it's valuable for the community overall to try to establish standards here. So we believe that this is a real, uh, it's going to be a new tech fundamental, machine learning. And so the sooner that the engineering community has standards around how we build these kinds of systems, the better it is for everyone. I think that it actually, it helps Google and it also helps uh, external educators and, and other companies as well. Great. Um, so I'm looking down, I want to make sure I get the terminology right. So uh, TensorFlow was recently updated not too long ago after mm -hmm. it was open source. Uh, to run on heter heterogeneous distributed systems, yeah. uh, meaning that uh, whereas TensorFlow originally could only run it on one single computer, now you yeah. can run it ac one single application across a dozen, across smartphones, across tablets. Uh, why is this better? Why did you why did you help develop yeah. this update? And what could what could a consumer application using this accomplish that it couldn't with the previous version? Yeah, so this directly ad addresses a, a very real and practical problem that we had within Google, which is that when you build a machine learning system, you don't want to be tied too tightly to exactly what the hardware is that the system is running on, whether it's in the process of learning or making predictions. So, for example, a researcher might want to start by developing or sketching their ideas just on their desktop using a GPU or something like that. But then when they want to scale that 
that problem up and see if it really works in a much bigger sense, they might want to run it on a cluster of CPUs across many machines. And then if it actually works and you actually have a product, you want to release that potentially as uh, on mobile as an Android app or an iPhone app. And the problem that we had was that we had to rewrite the machine learning system for each of these various stages before. And now the idea behind TensorFlow is that it allows you to have a slightly higher level of description of your machine learning system so that you write it once and then you're actually able to apply it on all these different heterogeneous platforms. Very cool. Um, so finally, you know, you, you've worked on, on technology that it can help autocomplete emails based on commonly used responses. Google uses machine learning to help protect against cybersecurity threats. Um, Overall, those, those make Google employees substantially more productive when, when all those kind of technologies kind of add up. Um, it's, all thanks to do, it's all thanks to machine learning applications mm -hmm. like this. Yeah. Um, so could you kind of give like a, a, a before and after comparison of today compared to five years ago or so? What a Google employee could accomplish thanks to all these, these productivity enhancing applications that they couldn't do before without you know, insurmountable effort? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I think that it's actually the things that we've developed aren't really specific for Google employees, right? They're, they're actually general systems and almost all of the, the systems that we have are available both internally and externally. So I particularly, you know, I love the, uh, the auto email res responding feature and use it all the time when I'm, you know, just need to quickly respond to an email on the go. And I feel like that's the thing that's most important to me. But uh, I know that a lot of other people are, are passionate about some of the, the other things that, that we've released. Um, for example, one of my colleagues, you know, just takes a lot of photos and always had the intention of organizing their photos and, you know, just never found the time to do that. And then Google Photos just takes that entirely off their to-do list, removes all guilt that you ever have to really organize your photos because now you can actually search for them based on what's in them. Very cool. Great. Uh, thank you so much. Appreciate it. My pleasure. Great.